Okay, great job. Um, so first off, I'd like to welcome everybody to the New York GA coaching webinar. Um, we're very, very delighted to be joined with um, more, more Trasta today. Um, for those that, that are, are aren't um, aren't too familiar with more, she'll she'll give a bit of a um, bit, bit of an update, a bit of a brief about her, her career path. Um, but just as a brief brief intro, um, she's a, a broadcaster with TG Cahar, um, Air Sports and and Off the Ball. She's masters in sports, exercise, sport and psychology, um, where she also has um, worked with with many teams um, across the last number of years. And she's also a host of the Sports um, Psychologist podcast. So if you get a chance to to check that out on, on Spotify, um, I, I I'd recommend. I'm sure I'm sure more about as well. Um, we've we've compiled the list of questions that you've sent in over the last week, and we've put them into different themes. And when we we've uh, placed them in this presentation, okay. So, Marty, do you want to give you give a wee hello there, and I'll, I'll click on the next slide. Hello, I will ship. I uh, like I was saying, this is the first stop in my international tour. I just never thought I'd be <laughs> New York. Listen, thanks, Amelia, for having me. Perfect, Mara. So we'll just we'll just we'll get we'll get stuck into the questions here now. Then, if you're if you're happy enough, um, just yeah, yeah. The, the first slide is just just on your journey, um, Mara. How did you get into your your, your current career path? Um, yeah, it's a colourful one. I think those pictures show, though, that I like talking a lot, which helped. It's very hard to find a photo of me with my mouth not open, yakking away to somebody. And um, I grew up in on Chiarua and Connemara, so TG Caha Radio and the Guest were always over, just over the road. So that was always kind of an obvious career path for a chatterbox like me, I suppose. So I went into NUI Galway. I did a degree in psychology and Irish did a higher diploma in advanced communications. I ended up in Radio Nogelsta from there, ended up in TG Car from there, ended up in the newsroom in RTE from there, went, so I meant to move to Dublin working in news and then between I did a year working as a sports reporter as well in RTE Sport and that kind of really solidified me that sport was where my heart was. So I stuck it out there for a little while longer and then decided to take the leap. I, I was always very interested in psychology and very interested in sport, and then it took me maybe a few years to think, oh, maybe this is some way I can marry them together. So I studied for, as you mentioned, there a master's in sport, exercise, and performance psychology. That took over a year. I did that while I was working full time. So that was a bit hectic, but you know, it was possible to do. Um, did that, and then I worked toward accreditation with the Irish Sport Institute, so that I'd be allowed to call myself a sports psychologist. I know it's different. In different countries and different regions around the world but in ireland the only person who can call themselves a sports psychologist are those who are accredited by the irish sport institute so that involves 200 days of supervised practice so you have to find somebody who is accredited who's happy to supervise you you create a case study so you work with people you submit your case study your board looks at it and they decide yay or nay they might say you know you're on the right track you need to do a bit more they might say okay you're accredited off you go it's just kind of a way to give people a safeguard so that you know that if I'm working with one of your athletes or with yourself or with your team that I've gone through this rigorous process and that basically I can be trusted with people to hopefully not mess things up too much. But um, yeah, I was really interested in sports psych and exercise psychology. So, and I think we're seeing more and more now as the years go by how important exercise psychology is, is to keep people moving and healthy. So I kind of, I was seriously considering doing a PhD in sports psychology and then, but there was a little voice in my head. I don't know what it was. I always was interested in medicine, but it just never seemed possible when I was younger. I don't know why. I just never put on my CAO form or anything, but it was something that was interested. So kind of call it a midlife crisis. I don't know. I said, look, if I don't give it a whirl now, I never will. And I applied. For some reason, the Royal College of Surgeons let me in. So I'm two years in there. And so unusual, maybe in one sense, in that my kind of part-time job is, I suppose, kind of high profile, so, you know, Basically, if you go into the Crow Park Hotel or Coppers, people recognise you. Nobody else will recognise you anywhere, but they're the only few places. <laughs> but, you know, that's just my part-time job. It pays the bills, it keeps the rent paid. And I'm lucky that I love it. And obviously, the sports psychology uh, is a part of that as well. But it's all a very big balancing act. So, yeah, sometimes, you know, some days can be really hectic, other days less so, but it's all just learning about how to balance it all and not fail exams at the same time while keeping the bills paid. You know, real life means you've got to pay bills. <laughs> and that's it in a nutshell. You, you just you just sort of touched there on um, work life 
work life balance and, and, and the juggling act. Um more one of the questions then was um what is there elements of sports psychology that can apply to, to work and life in general? Oh God, so much. Um first things first is goal setting. We all think we can set goals. I thought it too till I actually studied how to do it properly. And that's something as simple as having a schedule. Like people might remember when they were in secondary school, you know, you had you were told you did maths for 40 minutes, you did English for 40 minutes, you did Irish for 40 minutes, then you had a break. And you were regimented like that all through school. And that's really good for you. And then you kind of leave school and that kind of goes out the window a bit. And especially these days, I think, for people who are trying to work from home, that could be quite difficult. Or if you're an athlete trying to work away in a training program, be you an individual athlete or somebody who's working, you're normally used to being in a team and all of a sudden you're out on your own. That's really important. And I think the other big factor that sport teaches you as well is about disappointment and bounce back ability. And um, find me an athlete who, who's won more than they've lost. It's usually the other way around. You lose more than you win. You kind of learn that, you know, getting a knockback isn't always your fault. It isn't always personal. And that I think that helps you maybe achieve things maybe when you're going for job interviews, going for promotions, studying in school, that you kind of learn very quickly that the first no is not the end of it. Whereas I think perhaps sometimes maybe people who haven't got that sporting background maybe lack a little bit of confidence sometimes. Somebody might tell you, you know, we haven't given you the job and you might throw in the towel. Whereas, you know, people who've had the hard knocks of losing repeatedly or maybe trying to get into a team or stuff like that, it just, it sets you up for the knocks in life. I always call it bounce back ability. But I think resilience, goal setting, learning how to lose, learning how to improve. And that's the thing as well, like, don't you, people say, you know, that better phrase, you know, fail again, fail better. That's fine. It's okay to, like, not achieve things or not go as far as you thought, so long as you're learning from it all the time. I think that's the biggest thing, is that, like, you know, I try to not say you fail, you're just, you know, you're learning something new or that didn't work out. That's grand. Turn the page, try again. I mean, the only thing that's, that's absolutely fine in this world are death and taxes. Everything else you can find a way around it. And, and lastly, just just to finish off the the the, the your journey section, um, Maura, you sort of touched on it at the start, but how do you keep such a such a good good work life life balance? Like how do you do so many things and and, and keep on top of them all, um, especially with everything that's going on? <laughs> sometimes I don't, to be honest. Sometimes it's literally it can be very simply, especially a busy time of year, like. During the league, you know, like when I was presenting for air of a Saturday night and then we used to have horrible anatomy exams every Monday afternoon. So I had to kind of compartmentalize my life and say, right, Saturday morning, I have to get up at 7 a.m. and I have to do the study for five hours or I'm going to fail that test on Monday. Now, that was survival. That wasn't I'm going to do the best I can be in that test. It was just I'm not going to fail it. I'm going to learn enough to not fail. I'm not saying that's the right way to go through medical school. But at the same time, if I didn't do that, I wouldn't be able to pay my rent. So, you know, you have to juggle things and prioritize as they go. And that was a big thing for me. And somebody once told me, if you want something, don't ask a busy person. And I've actually learned that since this whole coronavirus thing began and everybody was locked down at home and all of a sudden all the work I was doing dried up, I had a lot more time. I'd love to say I studied more. I didn't. So it goes to show sometimes breaking things down and having things down in a schedule, written down in front of you, was the biggest way to help you. But it's also, I think, maintaining optimistic. And it's very easy sometimes to open the door for exams. And um, you just have to tell yourself, it's grand, take a breath, break it down to bite-sized chunks. And um, if you were to look at a schedule in September, last September for all the stuff I'd have to do till now, I'd say, oh, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, I'll never manage that. But you can, you don't, you're not superwoman, you're just laying up the ways to make it easier for yourself. And that means sometimes, and I found this quite difficult to learn, is asking for help. That means putting up my hand and asking maybe somebody in my class, can you explain this to me? Like I have friends who are, you know, practical experts in microbiology. Like why would I spend seven hours going through something trying to learn it when they can explain to me in 20 minutes and then I can go away and learn it myself. And the same way then I will do them favors back. And also people you're living in the house with, ask them, would you mind maybe cooking dinner tonight? Getting a takeaway, being a bit lazy sometimes. I think women in particular may feel they need to be cleaning, all this kind of stuff. No, you need to prioritize. And that means sometimes things will fall by the wayside. And that's grand, so long as there's nothing really serious and you pick it up again. You can't keep going full pelt all the time. That's nuts. Um, anybody who tries to do that will burn out. And that's a huge issue for athletes in particular. So there are the lessons I've learned, I think, from watching other people. And also myself sometimes feeling that yeah, I'm a bit tired. I need to take a break, and that means staying in bed every once in a while. That's cool too. Um, 
as you know, we've we've a lot of we've a lot of GA coaches um, and players on the on the call tonight. So a lot of a lot of questions about you know Gaelic games and and referring sports psychology back. Um, so we decided that the split them two themes. One is psychology in the GA, and the other one is like working with a with a, a set team. Um, and I should just at the start that if you have any questions, feel free or any you think more uh, more clarification on, feel free to write them in the chat feature um, in the teams, just in your right hand side there in the little the little, um, the little box, and we'll get get to it at the end, okay? Um, so just in terms of the wider GA, more um, do you think sports psychology is underappreciated in the GA in general? Um, I think that it certainly was. I think that's improving daily, weekly, monthly. And I, I would say it's progressed now from being underappreciated to appreciated, but misunderstood. And um, I think there's a, and you know, it's not people's fault in, you know, relatively sports psychology is quite a new science compared to a lot of other sciences we're used to hearing about over the years. So people have ideas of what it is, what it isn't, what they think it is, what it isn't. Lots of people don't actually realize it is a science, you know, it's an MSc or it's a BSc. And um, as part of that, that means you're going in doing interventions with athletes and teams based on evidence-based research and applying science to your methods. You're not going in on a hunch. You're not going in on a guru-esque kind of feeling. Um, I think perhaps there is a belief amongst not all, but a lot of coaches that that's the way it is. And you know what? You can't blame them sometimes because it certainly happened over the years that you know, well-intentioned individuals do go in doing performance coaching or psychological coaching, but they're not qualified in it. They might have a strong interest in it. They might have, you know, all Ireland medals to bait the band, but like that doesn't mean they're qualified in this. And then sometimes things can work out very well or they mightn't work out as well. And, you know, people might have a bad experience and people might have a great experience, but I just think that people perhaps misunderstand it. So if there's one thing that I'd like people to take away from here this evening is that Sports psychology is a science. It's not somebody who's interested in it. It's not somebody who's done a weekend course above a spar. It's not somebody who's done an, you know, a quick online reading course on psychology. It's great that people are interested, but it's not the same thing. And then to get your accreditation with the Irish Sport Institute, you get your applied experience, which means you're working with people and learning as you go while being supervised to make sure you don't mess anything up. And I think GAA teams, and not just GAA, actually all sports actually could all be guilty of thinking sports psychology is about making people, you know, win things or, you know, they think that you're that magic button that comes in. And that's not what it is. Sports psychology is just one piece of a jigsaw of it that goes into working with an athlete or a team. And um, I think that, you know, it's it's evidence based. It involves, you know, interventions and involves surveying people, it involves measuring feelings and people go, how can you measure a feeling when you can? That's what it is. So it is misunderstood, but I think it is getting better. And I think with more understanding comes more appreciation. I think when coaches see the amount of maybe background work that psychologists put into teams, you know, with surveys and psychometrics and that kind of thing, they realize, OK, this person is actively working hard. They mightn't be out in the field strapping up a player or something like that, but they are working. And I think as well, the role of a psychologist is evolving, I think, as well. It's less seen now as somebody coming in, you know, with web, with websites and PowerPoints. People now see sometimes it can just be a chat on the sideline and that's as, if not more effective at times, as reading the situation. Um, this next question sort of relates uh, back into that as well. But do you think co GA coaches and club coaches think they shy away from the um, sports psychology, or is there is there a taboo, or is it is it, is it getting better? Um, it's definitely improving. It is quite funny now. In general, ethically, you will never see a doctor say walk into a pub or a restaurant say oh, see that man over there, I fixed his leg, or see that woman over there, she, she was off depressed a few years ago, but sure, I gave her some pills and we talked her out and now she's great. And sports psychology is the same. Like a sports psychologist should not be standing up saying, I worked with this team, worked with that team. It's fine if that team says, oh, I worked with MT or I worked with Morris Ross or I worked with Joe or I worked with John. That's fine. That's their own business if they want to say it. But some teams would still feel and some athletes and some coaches would feel they don't want it to get out there working with the psych which is kind of silly because as one psych put to me once, and I think it's a great phrase and I repeat it all the time, you know, even the best sprinter practices a sprint. Do you think Usain Bolt didn't go practicing a sprinting for, before he was training? Of course he did. Like, do you think the best kicker in the game wasn't practicing his kicks? Do you think Tom Brady wasn't practicing his throws? Or, you know, like, that's ridiculous. But for some reason, it's still perceived by some people if you're working on the mental aspect 
of sport that it's perceived as a weakness, which it isn't. I think it's because people correlate it with mental health difficulties, which is not true. You can have absolutely zero mental health difficulties and you'll benefit from working with a sports psychologist because you're exercising your mind. And I think what happens now is as well is that coaches are beginning to understand actually there is value to this. And they go, oh, we'll bring in a cycle. We can't afford her for a whole season or we can only have her for one session. Or you get the Hail Mary phone calls. The one, you know, where you get the phone call saying, geez, we have a big game next week. We're going to be, we're going to be relegated or we're up for promotion. And then they're expecting the miracle effect that somehow I meant to come in and sprinkle some magic dust and they're not going to be relegated. It doesn't work that way because the mind is a muscle too and you have to work your muscle every day. It's like you wouldn't, an SNC coach wouldn't dream of coming in, showing you some weights, doing one session with you, working you out really good and say, grand so now, you know, you do that now for the rest of the season by yourself, you'll be grand. And the same works the mind. But I think that transition hasn't happened yet that people see okay, yeah, we need the psych in here. I think it's because everybody has a brain and they all think we can use it. But the thing is, most of us don't use our brain near the amount of ability that we could. And it's good to do that mind training. So it's improving. It's not there yet. GAA is, not that I say behind, it's not the GAA's fault, it's an amateur sport. More professional sports have gone down that road earlier, which makes sense. They have money and they have plans and finances, which, you know, GAA teams in general don't have. But they're getting there. And you can definitely see the difference between the haves and the have-nots. Now, those who have the budget will spend it on psychological supports between mental health, between performance, between match day experience, between off the field, on the field. It all feeds in. I always talk about the jigsaw. You know, it's a very important part of the jigsaw, but it's not the only part. It's just funny. We were chatting, we were chatting beforehand about, um, and I mentioned my club, when, when they won the, the kind of championship for the first time and ever in the history in our, in our, uh, in our career. We had a sports psychologist in, and it was it was just something that, you know, it was it was one part, but there was numerous other things that um that, that made us went on the day as well. Um, so that's just been touching and dairy hurling that club swatter if anybody's <laughs> interested. Um, and just just lastly, um, more um on on this theme, um, do you think there should be more about sports psychology or, or an understanding in qualified GA courses? I know there's there's a, a a good bit of touching on it in level two, but you think there should be, is there enough covered in, in foundation level one from, from your understanding? Obviously, I'm going to say no, there's never enough. Um, I do think definitely coaches could do with being taught on what sports psychology is, how to find the right sports psychologist, how to see if they're going to be a good fit in their team, even if they're not taught anything about sports psychology aside from very basic principles. To, you know, to be explained, like, you know, it's not people's fault. Lots of people don't know that the Irish Sport Institute accredits sports psychologists. Lots of people don't know that you should either be accredited by them or by the Psychological Society of Ireland. Because, you know, Ireland and the GAA is built on word of mouth. So people say, oh, I worked with this lad, I work with this woman. And actually, when you dig into their background, some might not be qualified at all. Some might be still excellent at motivating people, but not qualified. Some might not be doing sports psychology in a way that's evidence-based and that's grand but that's not sports psych if that makes sense so i think it would really do coaches it would help coaches a lot i think and you know clubs in general and teams if they knew what they should be looking for what should you know what kind of information would a sports psychologist be able to give them what what are the do's and don'ts what are the ethical lines like some coaches I've had calls asking, you know, can you talk to this lad? I think he's not right. You know, there's something not right going on with him at home. Can you let me know? And you pretend them, no, it's, again, it's the equivalent of, you know, me going into a doctor's surgery. And then, you know, my husband asking the doctor later, look, what's wrong with her? You know, it doesn't work that way. So people aren't really aware of the lines that you can and can't cross and the gray areas and that kind of stuff. So I think definitely it would help coaches, which ultimately would help teams. And that's the main goal. And that's why we're all here. We all want to improve the teams we're working with or the teams we're part of. So I think the more information coaches are given, the better. And I know it's a relatively new science, but it's there now and the rules and the regulations are laid down. So it's a bit like, you know, we had a situation where you could see physiotherapists and, you know, athletic therapists and massage therapists. They all have a role, but people know the role. And I think that's the difference. People are still being educated in that. So I think that definitely would be a big help. The more knowledge you have, the better you always are. Brilliant, Mark. I hope we have um, questions in regards to, to GA and chicken teams. Um, so we just sort of summarised um, the next the next set of questions into, into about five main points. Um, so, um, Mark, is there, is there similar techniques that, that um, coaches can do 
um, or you would recommend for your U16 players up to adults? It's under 16 up to adults. Yeah, you just put a book up there in a second. Sorry, Jerry, Wi Fi is checking. That's okay. <laughs> I can I can see my hopefully. Just sixteens up to adults, was it? Yeah, I'm just yeah. There's some of the techniques that we that um, coaches can incorporate into their into their teams for U16 up to, up to adult teams. Yeah, um, I think from under four is under eight up to adults up to the most senior of senior teams. A big aspect is fun, and um, people need to enjoy it. If you're not enjoying it you're not going to stick with it and um, and sometimes I think we all get so focused on dot crossing all our t's and dotting all our i's that we forget you know we're laying out our cones and we're doing this and we're doing everything right and we have a team sheet and we're doing this and we're logging this we're logging that we sometimes forget that it, it is sport at the end of the day and if people aren't enjoying it they're not going to give it a hundred percent and if something else comes along that gives them more enjoyment for that hour two or three times a week they're not going to come to you and um, that's really important and especially for anyone coaching women in particular and um, whatever about men and this is a broad generalization but you know we are speaking in broad strokes here tonight women need to bond before they play well men will bond through playing well so you can see how the fun aspect is very important there if that's not there you're not never going to get the full performance you can so that's one of the one of the pillars and the second pillar is um respect I think anyone playing under 16 needs to feel respected, under 8 needs to feel respected, senior player needs to feel respected. If they feel that their coach respects them as a person, they will give that coach more, they will give that team more, and that will evolve into respect for each other, respect for those in charge, and that those in charge also have the respect of the opinion of those they're dealing with, that people are able to speak to each other clearly and safely, you know, in a place you're not worrying about you know, oh, if I say this out, she's not going to play me next week, or if I say this, she will, she'll be upset, that kind of thing. And um, I think they're very important. And as under 16s, obviously you're on the cusp of adulthood, and I would work a lot with athletes kind of in that age group. And for them in particular, there's a lot of change going on. You know, we're growing up, getting bigger, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then the mind is busy. You're worrying about school. You're worrying about parents. You're worrying about, you know, what's going on in school, relationships forming outside of school, you're finding yourself as a person. So I think sometimes, you know, coaches need to give maybe give people a little bit of slack and understand that maybe sometimes the reason the under 16 or the minor player isn't coming to training, he or she might be getting trouble at home, you know, but they might want them to focus on exams. There might be other sports in school pulling off them. So not to worry too much about specializing too early, that, you know, if they love it and see what I mean, going back to the fun, if they love the two or three hours of training you're giving them a week, they're going to keep coming back. So that's what you need to do. And into adulthood then, again, the same pressures and transitions. People aren't just athletes. They're not just players. There's life outside. They're going to go to college. They're going to start jobs. They're going to meet, meet husbands, wives, kids might come into the frame, jobs, real jobs that are involved in your real responsibility and like the stuff we did, you know, going back in the day in college and that kind of stuff. So the good coach is going to be flexible and pliable and understand if Joe's not showing up to training, for whatever reason, he's going to know and respect that Joe has a decent reason for not being there and Joe isn't going to be punished because they have respect for each other. So it just comes back to, like I said, the two pillars, respect and fun. doesn't matter the age. If they're both there, you are going to have a happy, cohesive team. And with with regards to, to child and youth um, motivation, Maura, Say you, have a, you say you have a child that they're not correctly going well, they're having a bad game, or they can't quite master master a skill, like say that they roll up for the pickup. What what would you recommend that that coach do to you know keep that child interested, motivated, and and, and happy? I am um, actually I did uh, for anyone who's interested on that sports psychologist podcast. If you search for it wherever you get your podcast, I spoke to Shane Smith. He has kind of created own, his own voice for himself for, for, about coaching children. Uh, and he does a lot of, you see him a lot, very active on social media and on Twitter. And I did I did like half an hour with him. We discussed coaching kids and the do's and the don'ts. And again, it comes back, the fun thing that I spoke about, which is something I've preached about as much as Shane, if not more, 
and it also comes to you know helping them develop at their rate you see the trouble with coaching kids by age is that sometimes some children might be smaller than others some might develop a bit earlier some might mightn't have the confidence of others it can even be as simple as like if you're an only child and all of a sudden you're thrown into 30 you know you might lose your voice and your personality a bit or you might flourish because every child is different but when we're doing things by age instead of by ability as you get older and um, you know you can see how children get lost along the way and if they're not nurtured the right way you could lose them either to sport altogether or to a different sport so I always use Henry Sheffin as the example, you know, he was seen and he'll say it himself, you know, as the runt of the pack, so to speak, growing up. And if they had done talent acquisition and talent ID on children to the level that you see happening in some coaching and games today, he might never have played for Kilkenny. And what a loss that would have been to Kilkenny Hurling. And there's Henry Sheffins in every club. So and we're also dealing with now there is an obesity epidemic. There's children who haven't learned how to kick a ball properly. There's children who haven't learned, you know, how to move properly because of the way we're living now. So sometimes the coach really needs to bring it back to basics and be patient. And that's where the games come in. And that's where the absolute worst thing you could do if a child is not performing, and I hate to use that phrase about a child, is to keep them off the field, to not play them. Every child should play. It doesn't matter how, how good they are, how not good they are, I won't say bad. They need to be encouraged, they need to be nurtured, they need to be put playing into games where they can enjoy it, that they're going to get a handle on the ball. If that's not happening, they're not going to stay. And um, you really, really, really need to do that because your role as a coach um, is so much more important for the development of that child than it is for how good that child plays football or hurling. And this comes in for parents then as well. Parents, if the child isn't performing or doesn't seem to be enjoying training, it's no harm to maybe, you know, when there's no tension in the car on the way home to ask, you know, how was training tonight? Did you enjoy it? What did you like about it? What did you not like about it? And maybe explore. And like sometimes we may need to accept that maybe Gaelic games isn't for the child and that's okay. So long with, with your role as a parent is to maybe find a sport for them that is okay because every child should have a sport or an activity that they enjoy. And your role as a coach is to that child's development as a person and their enjoyment. Don't be that adult who's ruined sport on kids. We all know of them. Um, I've met a lot of them along the way and the mind boggles but why the underage shield is so important to these grown-up men who should have other things going on in their lives to be honest and um, don't be that adult just take a step back and realize don't abuse a child you know and when i say that i mean don't throw don't verbally abuse them don't make them feel silly don't make them feel stupid you know the best gift you can give a child is confidence and the way you're going to give them confidence is that they enjoy training they're having fun they're on the ball everyone gets to go playing and they're all going home happy and wanting to come back that'll keep them motivated like it's very very simple as human beings that's all you got to do just keep motivated by keep playing perfect that's a perfect um perfect advice um more and just it, it was a good a good question but um just you, you touched on if there is a way to basic so say it's a solo if you can you know balance it on a corner or say it's a role of me is there a way to, to make it um to, to make it be to make it overall easier on the on the child? Um but yeah, couldn't couldn't recommend Shane Smith anymore. He's like follow on Twitter if you do get a chance. Um the next question was just on um psychological um safety with how would you about developing that? Or what or what is that you talk up on me again? Oh, no problem, no problem. Um, just how would you develop a psychological safety yeah, with a team and, and what is that? Yeah, psychological safety. Yeah, now that can be very wide and varied as a question, depending on who put that in. They might mean something as simple as, I want to give somebody constructive criticism, but I want to do it in a way that doesn't hurt their feelings or doesn't make them feel bad about themselves. And it can go all the way up the spectrum to somebody, very serious issues. Or it can also be, you know, the safety of a player talking to a sports psych, you know, how much information is going back to the manager. So what you need to do there very, very simply, if you're involved in coaching, if you're involved in sports psychology, if somebody is coming in to do, be involved in the team. And even if, even if you're a team member, the rules need to be laid down very early on. What is acceptable? What information is acceptable to share amongst yourselves? What information is acceptable to go to the manager what information is acceptable to be discussed and then you need to create parameters that you need to create a culture within your team that one player feels safe to stand up say i think what we are doing is not the best way to do things we should be able to do things this way and give constructive criticism and that's 
really help psychological safety in that people feel safe, that they know if somebody is standing up saying something, it's not out of personal spite, it's not out of giving out, it's not about picking on somebody, it's about how do we make ourselves better as a team. And the way to do that is as well as, like I said, this is where the sports psychologist actually is very handy. And this is where the role is now beginning to evolve away from all the PowerPoint presentations, which do have their place and need to be done as well. But in a way that, you know, a, a manager knows if he's got a sports psych in, that the players can talk to that person and the, the sports psychologist can bring that information back in a way that is beneficial for that player, won't injure them psychologically, but also will help the team and help form the message. And that's what psychological safety is, that if I go to training session very, very simply, then I'm coming home not feeling victimized and I'm not feeling blamed, that I'm feeling nurtured, that I'm feeling I've had a bit of psychological growth at that session, but it be that maybe a new challenging drill. And, you know, if you mess up the drill, that that's okay, you know, that you're not constantly being given out to, that you're not feeling you're letting people down, that if things aren't going somebody's way, that the other players are big enough to see that this person's struggling and instead of beating them down, they lift them up with the tide. That's as simple as that is. And psychological safety as well means that my rules are whenever I go working with any team or any manager, I explain, you know, we're going to lay out, we're going to have a session at the beginning where we're going to talk about what what stuff we can bring back, what stuff we can't. And I always say out that I will, you know, I will only tell he or she what you allow me to tell them, unless, of course, something is very, very serious and it, it's a matter for a law investigation, in which case I would have to do that. But any other things, everything else is off limits, unless I get permission to bring that. And that means people will trust you. And that's another big thing too, but I know you mentioned earlier about some managers and some players don't like people knowing they've been working with a sports psychologist while that is changing. I always tell people that I will never tell people that I've worked with you, especially in the job I'm in. I have to earn people's trust. They don't want to be thinking, I'm going to be talking to her, she's going to have on off the ball next week. I always explain to people, no, literally, I'm doing that to pay my bills and pay my, me through medical school. You know, it's not cheap. But they need to earn my trust and they need to understand that what I know is not going to be broadcast to other people, to other teams, or about them, or in media circles. So that's why you'll never see me telling you who I've worked with. If people tell you that's grand, but I'm not going to be the one spilling the beans. And I think that's really important. That builds up kind of more psychological safety as well, because at the end of the day, you don't want to feel like that person has been gossiped about in class, you know. So it's just about making people feel that they can share information in a way that helps people improve. That's it in a nutshell. Um, brilliant, brilliant, Maura. Um, just in our, and we need to be sort of careful. We we talked this before, but we need to be careful with this next question. But just as um, if you feel a player is using an injury as, as a as a crutch, um, what what are your thought? What are your sort of thoughts thoughts on that to, to get away from that? There, just 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 your general thoughts on that question, or yeah, uh, um, yeah, uh, I assume a question like that came from a coach. Sorry, it was phrased. I could be wrong. And you know what? Sometimes some players do use injury as a crutch, but a lot of the time they don't want to. What's happened is they've really hurt themselves. They've come back from rehab. They've really looked after themselves. They've done everything right because they're dying to come back playing. But the trouble is they're terrified of getting injured again. Their brain and their mind is so powerful that it's saying, oh, the last time you did that, you ended up in an ambulance. Oh, jeepers, the last time you did that, you end up in the Santry Sport Clinic and Dr. Moore was slicing through your ACL. You know, and that will play on your mind. And then, funnily enough, you'll probably hurt yourself more because you're not committing to the tackle properly, you're not committing to the play, which we all know if you don't do that properly, you could really hurt yourself. And it's not so much that it's a crutch. It's not that you're afraid. It's not that you're saying, oh, I can't, I've hurt myself. It's just that your mind and everything else is protecting you from yourself because when you think about it if you break it down if you're playing football one member of a 15-man team and part of that involves really throwing your body down in front of balls and blocks and going into tackles that you know will hurt you like anyone in their right mind would say you're crazy don't do that so of course your brain is telling you you hurt yourself doing that now oh, come on now are you serious do you want to do that again so that can sometimes manifest itself and then that will build up and it creates anxiety, creates pressures. And next thing you know, you find yourself not being able to do that. And that's where working with a sports psych is very, very useful. In fact, I, I many of the time I've worked with athletes who, you know, not even high level, they might have hurt a leg or something. It's taken them a while to come back and there might be particular physio exercise that they can't execute. And that gets built up in their head as I can't go back, I can't go back, I can't go back. And you end up 
working with them. Like I'll use one example of a girl I work with. She hurt, she hurt a ligament and part of her rehab involved being able to jump up on a box. And she was told, until you can really do that, you can't expect to be going back to playing. She did it once and she felt her knee go from under her. Now, she said she's not even sure if it's psychological or if her knee actually did take a wobble because it's the first time she did it. But she physically could not get her legs up on this box in, in one box jump. So I had to go into the gym with her and work through it. And we had to break it down step by step by step. So that's the one bit of advice I would give you. If there's... If somebody feels that an injury is holding them back or recovery is holding them back from going back to play, they should maybe break down what facet it is that they're having an issue with. Like I worked with another athlete who had a particular aspect. He was involved in athletics, track and field. And there was one aspect that he just found his brain wouldn't let him do it. And the best way to deal with that is take it all back, strip back it all, walk through it in your mind. So let's say hypothetically it's the long jump. And for some reason, this this athlete feels that he can't jump and the last step, so to speak. You have to break it down step by step by step. Find that point, figure out why it is, think about it, find out the why and then work from there. And you can see how not everybody can manage that by themselves. They need support to do it. But a lot of the time when when people feel somebody's using injuries or crutch, OK, there are rare situations that somebody is just likes being, you know, lazy likes being on the couch likes getting the attention how are you feeling are you doing all right you know people ringing him asking him how he is but that's rare because the vast majority of people who are playing want to get back playing the best joy is being out in the field in the summer's evening training or taking on a championship game so if somebody is actively denying themselves that when they've been really committed to the team up to that point i would say they're probably not using it as a crutch they're just finding it difficult to deal with and that's when you need to break it down Again, that's speaking very generally. I don't know what the cause is here. And if I did, I might know a bit more. But I think that's the safest way to put it. But just realise for the vast majority, everyone wants to be playing. Nobody wants to be sitting in the dugout, especially this time of year. And just our last, our very last question on this slide, Maura, is um, what are simple strategies that you would recommend for players who experience bad nerves, anxiety before games? Oh, yeah, that's a big thing. And that's normal. And I would be worried about somebody who had zero nerves or zero anxiety or zero butterflies in their stomach before a game, especially a big game. Um, first of all, really helpful is to acknowledge and tell yourself, of course, I'm nervous. Um, and that's OK. It's OK to be nervous. This is a big game. There's a lot riding on it or there's people expect a lot of me or I want to perform to my best. So you tell yourself that. Then one thing I do with a lot of people and they find it helpful and actually I use it myself in nervous situations is that I visualize the nerves as a color and I don't know about you different people feel nerves in different places I feel it in the pit of my stomach and what I do I visualize it and I give I give the anxiety and the nerves a color and for me the color of anxiety and nerves for some reason is dark purple and what I tell myself is I'm going to breathe in very very deeply I'm going to breathe out very very deeply and with each breath in that colour is going to change the colour of cam. In me, that's light blue. Now, everyone's colours can be different. Some people like to give it a name, whatever works for you. Some people might feel it in their head. Some people feel it in their chest. As I'm doing that, as I'm breathing in and out, it's going from dark purple to medium to light purple to dark blue to medium blue to light blue. And that just comes from breathing. And the whole reason breathing works is that it's regulating your body. So your sympathetic nervous system is going nuts. Your adrenaline wants to go, oh, going to a game. Your parasympathetic nervous system is saying, hold on slow down here, boil, and that's why they clash in the middle and you get these, these adrenaline butterflies. The breathing helps regulate both. It helps bring them both into line. So I always say breathe in for six, hold for seven, release for eight. Anybody who does Pilates, if you don't, you should. It's very, very good. It teaches that breathing very, very well. And just take that breathing in. And it's funny, if you ever watch any comedies or anything like that, and when there's a woman in labor, what's the first thing they do? They tell her to breathe because it helps the mind and the body release any stress internally. So that's before a game. If you're having nerves during a game, what you need to do is you need to create some kind of trigger for yourself to remind yourself to snap out of it. It could be as simple as if you're losing focus. Um, I, you can tell people to just find a cue to change your focus back to the game. It could be as simple as giving your leg a shake. It could be as simple as giving your wrist a click. Whatever works for you, just to remind yourself to become present again. You don't really have time to be nervous in a game, but you do have time to lose focus. But I find, again, speaking generally, and again, this is where working individualized with a sports psych helps. 
in that you know you can find what what are your cues what makes you nervous some people aren't nervous until they see the team bus and then they lose the run of themselves some people are absolutely nervous until they see the team bus but i remember uh, jerry flannery speaking about this uh, the rugby player who's played for munster and he was saying that um he used to be so nervous in the run-up to a game and wanting to do everything so well if a game was on a saturday he started getting nervous on the wednesday by the Saturday morning, his mind was so fatigued he couldn't focus on the game. So you need to control your nerves. So the breathing definitely works. The imagining where the nerves come from and distraction techniques. That could be, you know, watching a movie, it could be going for a walk, it could be playing with your niece or nephew or your child, it could be doing a jigsaw, whatever works, try whatever works. Um, but try and work with somebody if you're having difficulty in doing that by yourself. Thank you for that, Maura. I'm sure there's people like me no on the screen can't wait to get back onto the pitch and then try those few few techniques out it's great even just like for job interviews whatever because we all get nerves you know and it's good if you can manage your nerves you're helping yourself a lot um as everybody's probably aware we had we had quite a few questions in um about um the current climate that's that's happening um with the the virus um so we've we sort of finalized the, the, the these questions in the three main ones um and the the first one just currently um do you have any ideas more um, on how to support athletes um particularly via online medium or practical strategies for more motivating people um during the unknown yeah and well first of all things like this can help some players other players will be allergic to things like this so i think that's the first thing is for coaches to acknowledge that yeah we do want to help our players but sometimes broad strokes don't suit all brushes and um, so it should be acknowledged that you know sometimes people might think i've put all these facilities online for them between coaching skills drills chats with psychologists and your man hasn't engaged maybe that's because it just doesn't suit this person and that's okay so long as something is suiting them so that's the first thing maybe chat to your players ask them what they want and um, you'd be amazed the amount of people who don't do that and then get surprised when they're told actually we don't want anything or we'd love to maybe meet up for a chat i know different scenarios are involved now depending where you are in the world like for example in ireland now we can meet up in groups of four in a public place so you know perhaps arranging something like that will work for some people not for everyone again dependent on where you are it's very similar to athletic identity and players having to retire and um, very very similar that some people used to love doing something and now they don't have it anymore and helping them to manage it so, and seeing their positives and negatives of lockdown assuming obviously you haven't become sick yourself or anyone you know that you know of has gotten sick or very sick or have had really terrible things to deal with and um, in which case you support those people through that in whatever way works best for them for most of us thankfully and um, it hasn't touched us in a way that would have people you know in a catastrophic position all of a sudden people have a lot more time helping people manage that time that can be positive in that all of a sudden you've loads of more time maybe to work on your fitness that you never had before work on your strength work on your psychological strength or it could be a negative because too much time isn't always good for some people people need to have their time filled and um, and it's the unknown the thing about athletic identities and people when they're retiring in general an athlete knows roughly when they're going to retire unless of course a manager retires them or you have a catastrophic injury most of us know we're coming you know if you're coming into early 30s you're thinking right time to hang up the boots maybe time to drop down a level so you can plan for it unfortunately for this pandemic nobody could plan for it there's a lot of up in the air stuff so that's hard and some people will adjust to it better than others we're seeing it in all walks of life not just sport some people have adjusted working to home, from home better than others some kids have adjusted to not being at school better than others so i think the biggest advice i could give is that you know whoever is trying to organize events to support their athletes that they realize everyone is different and what works for one mightn't work for another but if you ask them and it comes back to what we we're discussing earlier about a constructive safe psychological space if you have that team network together that will really work in in what ways more do you think things are going to change um in in, in irish sport um after everything is over Ooh, i just bring out my crystal ball for that one <laughs> <laughs> I don't know um, is my short answer. In the short term, obviously, social distancing is going to be a thing, so there probably won't be people watching games. Um, money is going to be a huge factor um, because money makes the world go around, unfortunately, and when there's no sport happening, there's no opportunity to make money, depending on the sport, depending on the level. Sponsorship is affected. TV gigs are affected. I mean, even on the most local level, the local junior C team might usually be sponsored, say, by the local 
pub. They're not having been operating for the last few months. How are they supposed to pay for your jerseys? Who's going to pay for the team bus to go somewhere? All that kind of stuff is going to feed into it. So things are going to be tight. But I think on the positive, a survey came out during the week in Ireland showing that most people are doing more exercise than they've ever done before because of this lockdown, which can only be good. So the intelligent uh, games administrator, you know, who picks up on this might say, OK, so Mary down the road is 47 years old and she might not, never play football with us, but she might have kids. She might want to get involved. She might be really good at this. And they will see this as a way to grow their membership and to keep people interested and to foster the next generation. Or they might think, you know, like I said, that same Mary, she might never play football, but she might really want to get involved with an underage team. And that's the way you get people involved. Because if there's one thing we've learned through this is that money might make the world go around, but it won't make you happy. It won't make you fit. It won't make you healthy. The people who manage to capitalise on people who making people feel happy and fit and well will come out of this much better. But it's not going to be easy. And, you know, it's not easy on the mind. There are some people who were used to training every day, used to being in a group. Some people might have worked from home all the time anyway. And going out to meet people at training was the best thing ever. And that's been taken away. And if you're involved in New York, there could be a lot of people there. And the only way they met people was through playing football with a club like this or say for example me when I moved from Galway to Dublin I joined a football team that's how I made friends that's been taken away from people so you've got to create social supports they just have to be online for these people or it has to be a chat but at the very least or some people might not want to engage but you need to give them the option and it's just basically checking in it could even just be a whatsapp message and just like it's it's so unknown we don't know what's going to happen the main priority is staying safe staying well and then fitness comes in beyond that and then trying to keep games and people together comes in behind that but if you keep fitting well that'll be the big part of it but I mean god knows we could be sitting here at this time next year saying what was she on about nothing like that happened so who knows it is, it is as you've touched on unless you have a crystal ball handy behind that that sofa like it's not um, but it's just it's interesting your your, your views on it um Maura um Colin Duffy just sent in a, in a message there about we have a question in regards to to no football in 2020 but there is breaking news um, that intercounty football could be back in, in September. Um, I suppose, what, what are your thoughts on, on both? Like, what if there is a, a relapse and there's no football in, in 2020? Or or what if things go to plan and we have intercounty football in, in September? Um, well, again, it's crystal ball gazing in one sense. We don't know if we're going to get a second wave. We don't even know if we're in the first wave or the second wave, the way things are going. Um, if things go to plan, I don't see why not. And again, people say, you know, what the hell do you know? And I don't know much. I just do know that I worked in ICU in a COVID unit in ICU for a few weeks there during the months of March and April when we were out of college. That was my my bit. That's what I was able to do. I was able to go in and work in these units and help doctors and nurses who were working really hard. And what I saw was, you know, there's controls put into place. Thankfully, in Ireland, people have worked really, really hard. People really respect the lockdown for the most part. The virus from what we can see has been more or less eradicated from the community or to such a low level that the risk is low so let's just assume the risk stays that way and again i'm only speaking for Ireland. i know if there's anybody here from new york it's a very different situation and things are going to be further down the road for you in a way that can be a safe and then the thing is ireland could ignite again next week so that's the other thing we need to keep that in mind we're not saying one country or one region is better than another it's just this is the way it's looking like at this moment in time we have controls in place we know it's 15 minutes of you know, very close exposure to that with somebody who is infected that would significantly up your risk of catching it. On the other hand, we also know if you're asymptomatic, you'll be asymptomatic for three or four days, which means if you're not looking after yourself and your personal hygiene and the hand washing and the, the aerosols, you could be giving it to a lot of people. You have to add that into the factor then that most people playing football are going to be age 40 and under. If they catch COVID-19, who's hoping they don't, but for the most part, if they do, they'll be okay for the most part. God forbid there could be an outlier and that's the trouble here. And then of course it's an amateur sport. Are you going to ask somebody who maybe lives at home with parents or vulnerable relatives to go out playing football and go home? So that's where the understanding needs to come in that if sport comes back, if football comes back, if hurling comes back, that if you've created that safe space that managers and players can speak to each other in a way that is level, that is safe, that is courteous, that a player can say, it's not that I don't love the game, it's not that I don't love the team, I don't want to play because my mother is in the vulnerable category and I want to be able to go home to her every night with a clear conscience. That's fair enough. On the other hand, 
does that mean that the whole country and the whole, all the sport is stay shut down? I don't think so. We spoke earlier there about the psychological importance of sport and movement and well-being. We need to look after that. And a really, a really good way to do that, as we know, is sport and team sport and organized sport. And then you have to start going into the philosophical question of risk. And you're asking yourself, how much risk am I taking by playing this game? And that has to be measured out. And I'm glad I'm not the expert making these decisions, by the way. But it comes a time you have to ask yourself, where, if I'm going to catch COVID-19, what are the chances here? Is there more chance that I might get seriously injured in a car crash on the way to that game? I don't know. That's a philosophical question I'm just asking. You have to evaluate the risk. There will be, as people start intermingling again, we are going to get flare-ups here and there. But if test and trace is there, it'll be shut down very, very, very quickly. It just means, and it's not the right way, but until this virus is eradicated or until we get a vaccine, there are going to be certain groups of people who are going to either have to take a chance, which sounds terrible, and I mean that in the worst, best possible way, or they're going to have to make a decision and a choice that they're going to step back a bit from life while it goes on for other people. I'm not saying that's right, but that's probably the way it's going to have to go because the world can't stay shut down forever. It stayed shut down long enough to ensure that the hospitals weren't overwhelmed. And my feeling is, as things open up, if we do get a second wave, they'll re-shut down again. And that's the way it's going to have to be until, you know, God knows what's going to happen to this virus. But I do think football is going to happen. My thing is, my worry is it might start and then it might have to stop again. And I think that's okay. I think championship is less important. League is less important. Winning and losing is less important. What is important is that people get their outlet, that people get to play their sport that they love. It's good for them. That people get to watch it on TV. That maybe some parishes get to go and watch a club championship game doing proper social distancing. That's really important. It's important for our minds, it's important for our bodies, it's important for our economies, it's important for happiness, but only if it's safe to do so. Well, well, well summed up, Maura, very well summed up. Um, we're just, we're under, we're under our last slide here now, and being a proud Galway woman, we had put a bit of Galway success there on the, on the, on the front page. Even though, even though in the Connacht Challenge of this year, Probably been knocked out by by New York, but listen, we'll we'll lighten it off this time, okay, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> so our first question is just in regards to um to, to mainly the Michael Jordan documentary that a lot of people's probably on this call has probably seen. And do you think um Michael Jordan's mindset and attitude would work in today's society, or or what's your general thoughts on the on the, the documentary? <laughs> I began watching the documentary and then I stopped watching it because I was coming up to exam time and I said, if I get sucked into this, I'll know all about Michael Jordan, but I'll probably fail hematology, which I really didn't want to do. But from what I gathered from watching the bits that I did see and then reading the bits about it online is that Michael Jordan is the epitome of a successful athlete, but that doesn't make him necessarily make him a nice person. And the one thing I would say to people is that, you know, you can have all the successes in the world. And I always use Tiger Woods as an example. That's not to say he was happy. And you're not playing sport for a lot longer than you are. So you need to make sure that you're cultivating relationships, that if you're playing on a team or if you're involved in a team, that people actually like and respect you. That's much more important than winning because if people like and respect you, everyone will do their best performance, best their ability, and the winning will become a byproduct of that. Good people become, and happy people become good performers. And I also think that, you know, that was of his time, perhaps, and there are still some athletes who operate that way today. I'm not sure they'll be the ones who are better off at the end. And that kind of authoritarian approach, at best what it gives a team, and the research is there to show it, at best what that kind of all or nothing authoritarian, my way or the highway and give it all approach, it's high impact short term. So you might win, do well over one season, maybe even a few games, like the new manager bounce. But if the right foundation isn't there, it's not going to last. There's a house built in quicksand, it's going to fall. Meanwhile, the house being built with solid foundations next door might never be as glamorous. It mightn't, it mightn't have that bright light shining very, very briefly and going down. But it's going to be a happy home. It's going to be a solid home. It's going to be a big home. It's going to be a home full of people all the time. I know what house I want to be in. And I'm not sure I want to be in Michael Jordan's house. I think what he's achieved is amazing, but I'm not sure if the things that happened along the way and I just felt you know there still seemed to me like and again this is my opinion I, I'm sure he'd be thinking I don't care what she thinks now why would he 
But when I was, the bits of it I saw, I'm thinking a lot of it seemed to be still based in bitterness and I show him and I did show him. And I'm thinking like, oh, there's more to life than that and there's more to support than that. I mean, a bit of it is nice. I mean, don't get me wrong, a small bit of vengeance is nice, but if that's your motivator, by the end of it all, it doesn't matter how many medals you have, how successful you are, it's not going to mean much to you because you're still going to be thinking of the gripes that didn't work out. You sort of touched on it before, like you used um, Jim Gavin as the the example that you know he don't you don't see him shouting and roaring very often, but I'm sure when he does shout, you know he gets he gets the attention or or he gets the the end goal. Whereas you know someone shouting and roaring, banging banging herds off tables, you know day in day out, you know it has a it has a short term effect, but not successful in the in the long term. Exactly, yeah. I mean, obviously there's always exceptions for the rule, but like, if, if somebody's shouting all the time or picking on you all the time, the way you're going to cope with that is it's just going to become white noise. You're just going to like not hear it. You're not going to hear the message. In a dressing room in particular, an athlete can only take in a certain amount of messages per, you know, session. So before a game, half time, full time, they might only hear one or two or at max three messages, three proper clear messages. So why would you waste that time yelling? Why would you kill your own energy? Why? And then you have the effect of emotional contagion. So if you've lost control of your own emotions, how are you expecting your team then to also keep control of their emotions? And if they're out there and then things are going, you know, not the way you planned, you can't be surprised if you're that manager who's been also lost your emotions in, in the dressing room at halftime. So when things are going upside down, you don't really see Jim Gavin near their emotionless. I don't know how he does it. I mean, it must be the air core training. But watching him, he'd be thinking, geez, what is he thinking? The most he'll see is a twitch of the eye. Brian Cody, on the other hand, you know, he's always interesting to watch. He does a lot of yelling on the sideline and that kind of stuff. But at the same time, nearly keeps the control. It's fascinating. And you do wonder sometimes which management style is better. Maybe neither are better than the other. Maybe just Jim's style works with the style of players he has. Maybe Brian Cody's style or David Fitzgerald's style works with the players they have. And that's what makes them good managers. They measure their tone for their for their team and the interesting thing about Daley Fitzgerald I always point out is I did a year with him in 2016 as last year's Claire Hurling manager I did a documentary with him with Radio 1 you can still find out he's just called Davey and the most the interesting the most interesting thing that people found on that was when they listened to the documentary they all said he didn't yell much and he doesn't for the most part the Davey you see on the sideline is so different to Davey in real life he's calm he's subtle he's quiet he gets the job done and he doesn't raise his voice. People have the other image. So maybe that's the, the sign of a good manager. He alters his tone and his game based on what needs to be done. Well, we're just in the last the, the last three questions. You'll probably be glad to know tonight. And I'll um, have my what do you think is the single most... <laughs> what do you think is the single most important thing to keep in mind when carrying out your role as a sports psychologist? Um, the single most important thing I think to keep in mind is to remember, we said earlier about the jigsaw, you're only one part of the jigsaw. You might be a very important part, you might be less important, but you're only one. Once a sports psychologist begins to believe that they are a Tony Robbins-esque guru, or once they begin to believe, like I said earlier, Ireland is a country based on recommendations. Once they start believing that their own hype, they say, oh, you know, he came in, she came in, and the team won all Ireland, or they won this trophy, or they won this in rugby, or they did this in tennis. Once you begin believing that, you're done because you're not working hard enough. You need to remember your role is just there as a support network. You're not there running the team. You're not responsible for the team. You're giving them the tools to perform their best psychologically and on a performance point of view. That is your job, Sinead. The book still stops the manager. You need to remember that. And sometimes... That can be hard because if you see a manager doing something that you think is not appropriate for that player, your job is to go to the manager and say it in a constructive way, I'm not sure this is the best way to approach it, how about this? And then a manager is well within their right saying, no, I don't agree with you and I'm in charge. And then you have to step back and say, okay, that's his or her opinion. And you have to take it. And you might not always agree. And I think it's very difficult on a sports site to do that because I don't think it works the same way I think, in fairness, no, I think physios have a bit of that as well, because they may say, I think that woman needs another week off before she goes playing, and the manager say, well, I need her. And then the physio can only go, okay, they can't pull the player, but you have to, you know, you have to accept it, but also live with it. And then if something bad happens, that player pulls a ligament, or if you feel that player is psychologically damaged by what happened after that, 
you have to carry that with you. And so the role is though to remember you are part of the jigsaw, sometimes a very important part, but only a part. The book stops the manager. You have to create a situation that you can give your opinion and then step back. And that can be hard at times. Um, the the second and you've got I think you've got two books with you um yes more as well. I do what are your your best resources best books that you would recommend? Well, I want to preface this first of all by saying I know sports psychology is a new science, and I know I'm no genius. Like I'm not saying I'm absolutely special, but I have had training that most people haven't had, and that thing was for physios, doctors, S and C coaches. There's something about psychology. I don't know if it's because everybody. Everybody feels a bit that they can do a bit of psychoanalysis themselves. That there's a lot of managers and coaches and players out there who think, sure, I'll just buy a book and I'll work from that. And I've seen people work from books with the best intentions. Sometimes it's due to lack of budget or lack of time. And they try to implement things that they see in books. But the thing is, these books have been written, you know, with psychological interventions that worked with this person, but it's not necessarily going to work for you. And the worst case scenario, you can do damage. So what I'm saying is, you know, don't, if you want to buy a book, fine. Read it and educate yourself, but maybe don't use it to the book, so to speak, because it mightn't work for you. So there's two books that I recommend for people who are interested in psychology in general, and it kind of can help you on and off the field as well. The first book, see, I love it, it's so filthy, called Flourishing, written by Maureen Gaffney. It's a big book, and you can see it there. It's thick. It's written, you know, in chapter format, and you can just pick it up and pick a chapter that interests you. Like, for example, this one here, rewiring your brain to make the best use of your attention. You can read this and it can give you little cues, but it's not going to give you any specific advice that could cause any problems. The crucial importance of making sense of life. That you might that sounds very philosophical, but it can be a good bedtime read. The second book was written by what people, a lot of people, a man people call the father of sports psychology in Ireland, uh, Aidan Moore, and he actually only died a few weeks ago. He was attached to UCD, he did a lot of sports psychology work. It's very academic as a book, I will say that. It's also written by David Lavalley, who's one of the, the uh, pioneers of sports psych in England. Um, if you're into academic reading, it's good. Um, it explains things well if you're into that. If you're not into academic reading, don't buy this book. It will bore the pants off you and you won't really want to understand it and you won't be able, able to, impl um, to implement anything. But the big thing I will tell people is, if you want to buy books, fine. But it, it's funny, like people don't, Coaches will often buy books, say, sure, I don't use sports psychologist, I've read the book. You wouldn't expect to be able to be a physio, to do physio's work by reading a book. And the other bit of advice I would say is that as well, sometimes it's good to read books written by athletes. You, Because you can kind of see maybe, and we all learn from each other's experiences and you can learn from their experiences and they can say, yeah, I can see why that wasn't a good idea. And it just makes you think about things you've done yourself, either in sport or outside of sport. And it just helps your mind think. So it's no harm maybe to pick up an autobiography of somebody you like, and actually sometimes somebody you don't like, um, and just read read through it and see decisions they made, didn't make, and ask yourself, what would I have done in their shoes? And that's a good way to learn and get your mind working as well in a way that's not really you know active or feels like mental gym work. You're just reading a book. And what we'll, we'll do is um, probably tomorrow or the next day, whenever this uh, webinar goes on YouTube, I'll attach um, both books um, on the on the email as well, and just to say which is more um, academically focused as well for everybody, if that might be useful. Yeah. And the the last the last question um, of of tonight, I don't think we've any any sent in um, by the chat feature, so we're we must be doing a, a top notch job. Um, Five more people. <laughs> <laughs> Our final question of tonight is, um, what do you think is Sorry, one piece of advice with regards to sports psychology that all GA coaches should incorporate into their sessions. Um, probably no surprise to anyone who's managed to suffer through this for the last hour that I'm a big advocate for fun. If there is no fun, you will not keep your players. They might even keep showing up, but they're not going to be present. They're going to be thinking about other things. And um, if you don't have that fun aspect, you are not going to get the best out of them. Like my slogan is on my website is making good people better. You're only going to be better if you're enjoying yourself. And sometimes a good holistic coach, if they have the time, if they have the resources, need to look at the player outside the game as well and see what their life is like outside. Are they having fun in the outside world? Is life, and I know life isn't great for most of us at the moment, but let's just assume everything is we're operating normally. You need to look and say, is this guy or girl, is she 
having fun? Is life okay for her? If not, what can I do to help him or her? It might be as simple as giving them a chat. It might be as simple as pointing them toward a resource. It might be as simple as maybe asking them, you know, how are things going at work? People may need to decide for themselves, is this job right for me? Because we all know all these things filtering fun. Fun, 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 enjoyment. If you're not enjoying it, look at those happy Galway lads. If you're not seeing those faces every once in a while, something's gone wrong somewhere. And it can sometimes be, like I said, with the best intentions. Uh, you know, you work so hard trying to get everything right that you nearly forget that people are supposed to enjoy it as well. And that's the way sport's supposed to be, fun. If you don't have that, everything else is not going to work. But if you have that, everything else will follow on. Um, Maura, that was fantastic. Um, I just say we've we've one question, um, but just what was some ahead? Um, a massive, massive thank you for helping me put together um, this this presentation here tonight. Um, and thanks everybody for the their questions that submitted in um, in time. Um, they they really make the bulk and, and make the the whole thing extremely enjoyable. So thanks everybody that um some of the questions and a big thank you to Maura. Maura, I think we've one more question. Sorry. Oh, sorry, phone's away. <laughs> There's one more question. We just find out there. We have one question in from Oshin, Osh McManus from a, a good a good down man. Um, uh, Mark, what what was the general timeline for you in becoming an accredited sports psychologist from your masters to full accreditation and working with teams and athletes? Oh, um. The Masters took one full calendar year and I began working on my case study straight away after that. I was very lucky in that an athlete got in touch with a sports psychologist who I knew and he didn't have the budget needed and he had you know, a specific issue that had to be done with. He didn't have the budget basically to be able to afford to pay her for this. But she also knew that she wanted to help him and she also knew that I was looking for somebody to work with. So luckily enough, he was happy to become my case study. And then I was also very lucky that I had uh, another sports psychologist, Dr. Thig McIntyre. He was happy to supervise me. That Those 200 days took me two years. I actually still work with the same athlete, actually. You know, we get on well, you know. <laughs> um, so that took me, was it two years, two and a half? Um, nearly three. No, yeah, two, two and a half, say, two and a half years. I got those 200 days in because I was able to, I'd, I'd left my job in RTE at that point, I had a lot more spare time, I was able to work with him, I was able to work with other athletes, I worked with teams, and it was all supervised, which really, really helped, and I did lots of um, lots of continuous professional development, I travelled to a few conferences, that all helps build up your portfolio, and then I wrote up my dissertation again and my presentation and made my case study. But yeah, and I'm aware of the two and a half years, two years, was actually rather quick, um, it takes people a lot longer, but it was something I really wanted. And because I had finished the job and I was in between that job, I was freelancing at that stage in sports journalism, which is, you know, it's kind of a Saturday, Sunday job. And then you kind of have a lot of time off during the week. And I just told myself, right, don't be lying in bed. Don't be hanging around. Don't be going to tasks on Shop Street. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Don't be spending so much time on coppers. I just focused on getting that done. Most people, I think, take maybe three or four years to get it done. And I know um, if Wolchin is based in County Down, he might be working under the British system as well, which can take a bit longer. I think they have a more defined career path and it's much more maybe, it's easier in one sense, but it does take longer. But I think it's easier to make your way through the steps that can be done under the um, the British Psychological Society or with BASES as well, of which I'm a member. And um, I think that's really helpful as well. But yeah, that's my very long-winded answer. I hope that helps. <laughs> Brilliant. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure that does. Um, Washington is. He just says he's master's in sports psychology. Um, so he would love to have an idea of, of what what is next. Um, just scrolling down, we have we've no more no more questions. Um, just a few a few a few well done there, um, Maura. Um, so that that's really us for for tonight. Um, again, thanks everybody for for remaining on the call and tuning in. The YouTube will be a video. A YouTube video will be available in a few days' time. Just, just, just give me a chance. And lastly, Maura, thank you so much for your for your knowledge, um, your experiences, and just just your general thoughts and on 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 sports psychology and what you've learned throughout your years. So, listen, I've I hope everybody else can take as many things as I've taken away from from this evening. Um, and thank you very much. I know you're moving house today, and you, your exam was finishing yesterday. Um, so thanks for making time for us.
No worries. Thanks for having me, guys. And I look after yourselves, and I hopefully I'll be back in New York soon. Guys, <laughs> good stuff. <laughs>